what we have grown up to believe as normal eating behaviors are actually making the majority of us very ill. You're gonna remember this every day for the rest of your life. If you want to get to a goal, if you want to get to your dream, you got to focus on all the little steps. You have to put in your time, you have to be patient, and you have to enjoy the process. Whatever you're doing now, whatever you want to be great at, whatever you want to be special at, I'm sure you, you may be already be good at it, but to be extraordinary, you have to do extra. I firmly believe that we are all here for a very specific reason, to do something truly extraordinary. But what are you going to do to get there? Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on because I have a lot of uh, personal questions as well for digestive health and you are a specialist. You're also, she's a specialist. How would you describe exactly what you do? And I know like what you, you, you study, but I want the audience to hear it from you and then what your focus is. And I want the audience to know she's also a fitness fanatic and she trains very hard every morning, very early, which is very impressive. Um, so please, why don't you tell the audience exactly who you are and what you do? So I teach grown adults how to eat. And I, I hopefully um, teach people that what we have grown up to believe as normal eating behaviors are actually making the majority of us very ill. And it's sad because it's something we do every, do, every day, multiple times a day when it comes to nutrition. And in all of my years of training, so four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, um, three years of residency, and three years of fellowship, there was only one person, really my last year of training, that mm. taught me how to talk to someone about what they're eating on a typical day. Mm. And then once you have that information, how do you make recommendations that fit within their goals and their underlying health conditions? And that's sad to me. You know, because a lot of health care is really sick care mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of, you know, prevention, although we hear about it all the time. We hear that term all the time. Um, true prevention is not profitable for a health care system. Mm -hmm. But I think that there are ways to make it innovative and sexy and interesting because people truly want to learn about prevention. And that's all about lifestyle modification, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I think just in health care. Um, if a patient comes to see me at a tertiary referral center and they've been struggling with their weight for most of their life, I assume that someone along that path has asked them what they eat. And unfortunately, oftentimes that conversation was never had. Understood. Understood. So when did this, um, I guess your fascination, interest, when did it pick up? At what age did you say, okay, let's go. I, I really want to know more. And I always felt, uh, should I call you Dr. Perlin, Michelle, Dr. Michelle, what would you prefer? Um, yeah, Dr. Michelle sounds okay. good. Dr. Michelle, <laughs> Dr. Michelle I, for most of the people that I have on here, their, their love or their interest or their passion project, whatever it may be, their right life, their career starts from a young, young age. So when did it start for you where you were super excited to kind of get into this uh, as a career? Yeah, when I was in elementary school, I initially wanted to be a vet. And then I realized I only liked small dogs. So I figured that career was never going to happen for me. Um, and then I was just fascinated by health. And I think for me, I went through it all myself. I started going to the gym. That was my stress release. And I'm very fortunate that that happened at a young age when I was in middle school. Mm -hmm. And then throughout high school and college, um, it just became something that kept me happy. Mm -hmm. And school was hard, but I figured, you know what, I got to work my butt off and stay active because otherwise there's no way I'm going to be able to deal with all this stress and workload and everything. Mm -hmm. And it was actually, I think my second year of college that I started working out with my friend in the morning and I've never gone back. The morning is my time, just like you. Yes. No one's going to bother me at 4.35, 5.30 in the morning. No one's going to bother me because most people are still sleeping. That's right. And I get more done between 5 and 7 a.m., than I do, you know, the rest of the day for the most part when I have idle time, it's the um, best because time. that's when I'm most focused. I think a lot of people are kind of like that way, Absolutely. but that wasn't for me initially. I got into it in undergrad and then it just became my thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important is establish that routine and it takes weeks to establish a habit. You can't just start working out at 5 a.m. one day and think that's going to be easy there are plenty of days that I don't feel like getting up. Mark, I'm sure you're, you're the same. There's mm -hmm. probably days where you're like, you know what? I don't feel like getting out of bed, Absolutely. but that's the hardest part is getting out of bed. And once you're out of bed, 
it's a lot easier because you know how good it feels to feel good. Absolutely. You know, a, a, a small hack that I want to share with the audience, I tell clients that have struggled to get to the gym, I said, look, you don't even have to train. Just wake up and go to the gym. And if you want to go home, go home. No one goes home. <laughs> hey, I'm here. I might as well do something. So getting to the gym and then I see you working so hard in the morning. So kudos to you. It's impressive. And I love to see doctors living a healthy lifestyle because we all know doctors who don't live a healthy lifestyle. So it's hard to uh, talk it if you don't walk it, if that makes any sense. Yes, some people in healthcare are some of the most unhealthy people I've ever met mm -hmm. um, because throughout training, they, it's very challenging mm -hmm. to, if you're on call for 28 hours, when are you going to go to the gym? You're not going to go to the gym. You may be walking around the hospital a lot, but you're sleep deprived. And as soon as you get home, you're going to pass out for the next 12 hours. And a lot of times, even in the hospital, there's no healthy options. Mm -hmm. So you have to bring snacks and food with you mm -hmm. because even in the hospital, there's some of the most unhealthy food I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you don't develop those strategies early on, then as you go throughout your career in whatever profession you're in, it doesn't get easier. You know, throughout training, people say, okay, well, I'm going through medical school. Once medical school is over, it will get easier. Then comes residency. Well, once I'm no longer an intern, it will always get easier. Oh, well, once I'm faculty, it will always get easier. And it's never any easier because mm -hmm. you have more and more responsibility. For sure. For sure. Yeah. That's absolutely spot on. So mm -hmm. you went into, I guess, digestive and helping people mm -hmm. learn how to eat adults. take. Care. I guess like how does that even start? You get someone, you get a client in there and, or a patient in there and you, you have to help them. They have some sort of illness. And I, I, I'm just guessing, Do you, you what, what is your approach? You want to like track what they eat? How can they make a shift? And then we'll, we'll get in. I know it's a deep dive, but we'll get into the other stuff. I'm very fortunate in that um, the patients that make an appointment with me have already gone past the contemplative stage. So they already have decided they need help and they need advice on nutrition mm -hmm. and they're ready to make that change. So if they make that appointment, they're already past step one. Okay. If they show up to their appointment, they're clearly ready. And if they show up on time or early in Miami, then they are really ready because most people are on Miami time. <laughs> that never happens. That, <laughs> you know? that, that, so, that never so when happens. people show up, yeah, a lot of them are ready to make that change. So it's not me making that initial conversation. They've already had that conversation with someone or with themselves mm -hmm. to take that first step. Mm -hmm. And really the main question I ask people is what is their why? And I think that also plays a huge role in working out at the gym. Like why do people want a trainer? Why do people want to go to the gym? Is it because they want to become healthier? They want to reduce their blood sugars? They want to look better naked? They want to be around for their children. You have to figure out what is their why, and that's how you are able to connect with them. Mm -hmm. So I have plenty of patients who come to me, and they may not care about their weight, but they know that the arthritis in their knee will get better if they lose weight. All right. Absolutely. And so it's pain is their why. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I, I don't know if you can put a percentage on it, but the amount, the amount of people that come in there that actually truly – you identify their why you mm -hmm. see that they clearly need to lose weight, health issues, illness, call it whatever you want. And how many people actually follow through? That's my question mm -hmm. and have success. Even if it's a small amount of success, how many people mm -hmm. follow through? I guess that's the first question. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to say. I mean, I have the total denominator of patients who come to see me for weight loss, but the ones that don't follow up, I'm not tracking them. I mean, I'm sure I could look back and see mm -hmm. the ones that are most successful are the ones who follow up, whether it's reaching out to me online, like through the electronic portal, mm -hmm. where they'll send me some of their food tracking data. They'll send me their weekly weights. They'll keep me updated if they go on a trip and gain a few pounds or something. Those are the ones that are most successful because they have that accountability to not only me, but to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm sure there are plenty of people who do wonderful and, and never see me again. And maybe that's because they don't need to see me again and they've already reached their goal. Um, so it's hard to say, but I've been very fortunate with amazing patients who want to feel better and do better and inspire others. And so they're, they're pretty darn good at following up. Understood. Understood. Mm -hmm. So 
I want to get some hacks for our audience, and I have a I have a slew of questions to ask you. Mm-hmm. But the how do how does someone acquire health? Let's say they've had a poor diet, poor nutrition, but I want to have like awesome digestive health, just in general. Mm-hmm. How do I get there? What do you suggest? What do you recommend? What have you heard that we can stay away from? A lot of questions here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it totally depends on the person. Um, where there's a lot of nuances with nutrition are people with underlying gut issues. So if someone has celiac disease or ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, chronic inflammatory conditions of the gut, we know that fiber is very important for gut health. So the fiber is a prebiotic and the bacteria in our gut, the microbiome, so the flora, basically break down that fiber and produce um, short-chain fatty acids and a lot of other things that help promote good gut health. Mm -hmm. Um, But patients who don't feel well and have a lot of diarrhea or bloating, if I were to tell them that they need to eat an apple and they need to eat celery and they need to eat cauliflower, they're going to feel super bloated. You can't go from zero grams of fiber to 30 grams of fiber in a day. They're not going to feel well. And they're going to say, Doc, you clearly don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I feel awful. I'm going to go back to eating pizza. So you have to figure out what are their underlying conditions that may make the the nutrition recommendations a little bit nuanced. But in general, if someone has normal gut function, so normal digestion and normal absorption, you want to really get people to consume fiber. Mm -hmm. So fiber comes from things like nuts, fruits, and vegetables. Um, I, there's a ton of diet food products. I don't know if you've seen them out there, like the low carb breads, the keto breads, the low carb tortillas, yeah, the pro granolas. Yeah. It's this, you know, the diet food industry, billions of dollars. There are a lot of, um, uh, diet products out there that kind of follow this keto thing. Um, the issue here is that, you know, a serving of celery has one gram of fiber. So a third of this has one gram of fiber. Some of these keto breads or bagels have 25 grams of fiber. Wow. Wow. Why do they do that? They add a ton of fiber because it makes the label look prettier. Mm -hmm. So they are calculating the total calories based on the net carbs. So if let's say the bagel has 20 grams of carbs and 15 grams of fiber, they're doing 20 minus 15. They're assuming there's only five grams of net carbs. So they're only calculating the five times four calories per carb, Mm -hmm. and that goes into the total calories. So it makes the label look prettier. The, The companies are assuming that you don't get any calories from fiber. And that's actually not true. Although fiber is poorly digested by the body, we still digest some of it. So we actually still get some calories from fiber. So you have to be very careful with those diet food products that show you the net carbs and then calculate the calories just from the net carbs. So can you imagine eating um, 25 servings of celery and feeling well? No, not at all. It's like eating 300 oranges, right? What? Like eating 300 oranges. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's how much fiber is in one of those bagels. Mm-hmm. So no wonder when people have some of these diet food products, they feel super bloated or maybe they get constipation or diarrhea. Mm-hmm. And it's because there's so much fiber, it's just not natural. And too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Interesting. And that's you know part of the issue here is you know people will get a salad and they load everything in the kitchen sink because they hear all these things on social media, it needs to have all the colors of the rainbow. So you got to have nuts and cranberries and chicken and like 10 different vegetables. And you've just consumed 30 grams of fiber and feel awful. And it's too much. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting you say that because we, that we, if we know exactly what to take in, there's still like a, a lengthy and very particular process that each individual must go through that's very specific to each individual. And mm-hmm. it, it's so cliche to look on social media or, or hear something. You got to eat a lot of uh, spinach. You got to eat a lot mm-hmm. of it, the, the rainbow. And it's like, if, if I'm an unhealthy eater and I take that in, it's that was actually one of my questions. You actually get mm-hmm. sick. You know, you feel terrible and you're like, well, I'm yeah, healthy you stuff and I feel bad. So that doesn't work. And my doctor's terrible. Right. Yeah. So I think the exactly. coaching side of that is huge. Mm-hmm. And equally as important as what you eat is how much you eat and how fast you eat. And that's not included in any of the macronutrients, right? Macronutrients only tell you part of the story and calories only tell you part of the story. 
But if you're consuming, let's say, a lot of artificial sweeteners, which are, you know, calorie free, mm. or you're drinking a ton of sparkling water or diet soda, and it's calorie free, all you're doing is sucking in a ton of bubbles. And then people will start burping. And they say, oh, well, the seltzer water helped me with my with my gas. No, it's all the air you just swallowed. Mm-hmm. Even things like using a straw with your liquid or guzzling down liquid, you know, while you're working out, just sucking in tons of water from the bottle, you're swallowing a ton of air. It's called aerophagia. So a lot of people will say, I'm always bloated. What is it that I'm eating? It may have nothing to do with what you're eating. It may just have to do with the simple fact that you're chugging fluids in at a super rapid rate, or you're chugging fluids in while you're eating, or you're consuming carbonated beverages, um, and, and have nothing to do with the actual food. That's super interesting. I've never even, I mean, I've heard like pace your food and don't eat too fast, mm-hmm. clearly, but I've never heard that that could actually, or the bloating could be a byproduct of the speed. I mean, oh yeah. Sense. Most people don't chew their food. I mean, I am definitely um, guilty of that because I think when we're so busy doing a million things and we're on a Zoom call and we're eating or we're eating in the car on the way to work or something, we're not mindful of it. So we're literally shoveling food down our face Digestion starts in the mouth. That's where you get the initial enzymes that are released by the act of mastication or chewing. Mm -hmm. We don't chew our food. You now have, you know, a ton of a big food bowls like carrots going down into your stomach. And then it's a lot harder for your body to actually digest that food and then absorb the nutrients. So you end up getting a ton of big, uh, big boluses going through your intestine. And then that can actually cause a lot of GI issues. Mm -hmm. So chewing your food, it's very simple. That's another big thing that I have to teach, particularly grown men, is to chew their food so it doesn't get stuck in their food pipe. (laughs) Isn't there, well, that's uh, life and death, but isn't there something as well to, you know, if you chew your food, you'll actually recognize the feeling of feeling full and feeling, and so you don't, you know, I've seen people eat, you know, four appetizers and the entree comes and they shovel it on the entree and they eat some of their significant other's entree. And I'm like, dude, you just consumed 3,500 calories. <laughs> like, no, way, way less. And I'm like, no, 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 way more, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just guzzling. Yeah, how do you teach someone to chew? Do you give a, t- give a tempo? Do you give timing? How does it work? Uh, yeah, That's it's very challenging. Question, but I'm sorry. What? Sorry to interrupt, but it sounds like a ridiculous yeah. question, but not really. No, it's so important. Um, What I typically tell people is when you're eating, try not to be doing a million things at once. Mm -hmm. You know, shut off the computer. You shouldn't be eating while you're watching TV because then you're constantly putting something in your mouth. It's amazing. When people go to the movie theater, they they feel like uh, they have to literally eat something the entire movie. Like, why is that? You're, we're not going to starve during a two hour movie. It's ridiculous, <laughs> but we just, you know, that's, it's an ingrained behavior where we have to have popcorn and, you know, raisinets or something while we're watching a movie. It's crazy. Mm. Um, but it's a simple thing. It's chewing your food until you can no longer feel the texture of the food in your mouth. It should be liquid in your mouth before you swallow it. It's very simple. It depends on the the consistency of the food. Sometimes it may be 30 chews, sometimes Mm -hmm. a lot less, Um, but you don't want to feel the consistency in in your mouth before you swallow. So it's very simple. But it also, when you're talking about satiety, it takes about 20 minutes or so for your body to tell your brain that you're full. Mm -hmm. So if you see a huge plate of food and you shovel it in within five minutes, you're probably going to finish the whole plate and then have another plate because you don't, your brain doesn't even know it's full yet. Mm-hmm. So if you take about 20 minutes for your meal and then you sit down and you say, am I still hungry? More than likely you're not hungry. Mm-hmm. Understood. So is there a strategic approach based off what you just said when you mm-hmm. get to the restaurant and they say your table's not ready? Would you like to have a drink at the bar? Mm-hmm. They give you a drink, spike the blood sugar, or then you get to your table would you like another round of drinks? Is that strategic? It is strategic. No, no, <laughs> that's not strategic. I'm very upset. Unless the drink is water. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I'm saying if it's, I mean, I'm saying it's strategic in regards to making you feel like you're starving, even though you may not be starving and now your appetite is through the roof and now you're ordering more food and your, your eyes are bigger than your stomach, so to speak. 
So well, I think the biggest thing to prevent that, there's always going to be delays at a restaurant. Have your appetizer at home. So before you go to dinner or whatever restaurant for lunch or whatever, have, let's say, a small apple and then a little packet of nuts. Because fat, when you compare the macronutrients, fat has the largest influence on slowing down the rate at which your stomach empties. So if you have some nuts, then that's going to have a major influence on slowing down your stomach. So even though it's, I don't know, 14 almonds or so, 100 calories, just by having that, you're gonna be less hungry when you go out to dinner. And so make that your appetizer because often the appetizers have more calories than the actual entrees. And all the appetizers have a ton of salt. Mm -hmm. There's never steamed veggies. There's never plain carrots, right? With guacamole, it's usually like pita chips with the guac, right? Why is that? Why do you think that is? Why are all the appetizers so damn salty? Just, you know? Yeah, make them tasty. No one would buy them, <laughs> right? That's one reason. Another reason is salt stimulates thirst. Mm -hmm. And how do restaurants make money? They mm -hmm. make money off their beverages. That's right. I never knew that until one of my patients who's in the food industry taught me that. I always thought, well, it must be the steak. They must make money off the steak if right. it's a $50 steak. Right. But they don't because by the time you get the meat and ship it and store it, there is actually not big cost margins on the profit margins on the on the meat. It's actually the beverages that are super cheap and easy to ship and store. So they end up getting you super thirsty and then you buy a bunch of drinks before you ever get your meal. I mean, why do they give you chips and salsa? Why are there salted nuts at the bar? They don't care if you're hungry or not. It's just going to stimulate your thirst and you're going to get more alcohol. Understood. So that makes perfect sense. There's a popular restaurant in Miami that you probably know of. I'm not going to name the restaurant, but they serve strips of bacon at the bar. Interesting. I have not heard that. At the bar. <laughs> I don't know which restaurant I mean, that's, that is. That's, like, ne that's next level of salt right there. So Next level. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> now how about in regards to tracking? So someone... Well, why would I see where you train every morning? Uh, I'm in the fitness and wellness community. I see a lot of, it, I wouldn't call it yo-yo dieting. I would call mm -hmm. it um, kind of, you know, we have bulking season. We have, you know, getting lean, getting ripped, competition form. What are the side effects of bulking, gaining lots of weight and trimming down? several times over the course of the year. Yeah, and I've been through it. So I used to compete in bodybuilding and I've put my body through the gamut. Um, this was, um, I started actually back in undergrad and then did some shows through medical school and residency and even as faculty. And what I, you can do it a healthy way and a very unhealthy way. I would literally do two hours of cardio every single day and not a minute less. I was in the gym before classes and after class. I, I still don't know how the hell I did it. I don't but know I would study <laughs> I would study and listen to audio like classes and things while I was on that damn stair mill. And then I would eat plenty of calories, but literally no carbs. I mean it was literally like celery. I took out all fruit. It was greens like broccoli and green beans and then a ton of like lean protein and protein shakes. And I lost a ton of weight. I lost probably 30 pounds in six weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you do your show and then you start eating normally again, um, you gain all the weight back. And then it really creates this body dysmorphia where now that you're normal weight, you're comparing yourself to when you're at your leanest, you think you're fat. Right. And it's crazy. It com it's a complete, uh, it really destroys kind of um, how we look at food um, for nutrition and performance. So I've been through all that. I've done several yeah. shows and I gained all the weight back and oftentimes more. Because when you lose that much weight, when you're doing that much cardio, you lose muscle mass. It doesn't matter how much you're lifting, you lose muscle. And lean body mass is the key to your metabolism. And so it really wrecks havoc. And when you're so stressed and you're not sleeping well and you're exercising that much, you lose your period. So that can definitely affect your bone health. Um, and and your cortisol, your cortisol shoots through the roof. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I've been through it. And a lot of people are desperate to lose weight. 
and they will hop on whatever trendy fad diet is out there. But at the end of the day, the weight loss is actually not the challenge. I have plenty of patients who have lost 30 pounds eight different times. The key is how do you create a lifestyle change that will help you lose the weight and keep it off plus or minus a couple pounds. That's mm -hmm. really the way to do it. But that's the challenge. Right, right. And I think it's a, it's a, as you said, that's certainly the challenge and it goes beyond if you've taught them or helped them, assisted them in losing, you know, several pounds of weight, 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds, it's, that's not the issue. It's, you know, I don't know how deep we can go into this, but it's really mm -hmm. the psychology, as you said, the dysmorphia in how they view a calorie uh, as a calorie or, oh my God, I can't eat, I can't eat a piece of bread. I can never touch a piece of bread. I'm going to die if I eat a piece of bread. It's just this unrealistic view of uh, how dangerous food is or how bad it is for you. And it goes to a place of such negativity that you create these uh, systems that there's no, no sustainability built in. It's just it's, – it's beyond unhealthy. And I think it's beyond healthy not only for the way they're eating but also for the way they're thinking about food. Oh, 100 percent. And that carries on in – relationships and work and everything. It completely takes over people's minds when they start fearing huge food groups. And, and it really can be a disaster. So a lot of what I do is just figure out what are someone's goals. I actually don't ask the majority of my patients to track their food. I will only ask them to track their food if they're not seeing the results they need. Now, I have some patients, particularly like engineers or people who are very into numbers who want to track. And that's great because I love looking at data and I can give them more objective um, recommendations on what sort of tweaks to make. But the majority of my patients are not going to track. They don't have the time nor the patience to do it. And that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. um, so I give them guidelines. I figure out, okay, how many starchy items are they eating in a typical day? So a patient wants to see me for weight loss. If they're having, let's say, beans and rice for one meal, um, two sandwiches and some chips, um, that would that be about would be five fiber items per day. And then I try to cut it in half. I'll say, why don't we cut down to around two high carb items per day? So you get one sandwich and then you get quinoa or you can have oatmeal. So I try to cut it in half. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a pretty kind of good goal to start from. It doesn't mean no carbs. It just means if you're having five servings, that's probably too much. If you're not an endurance athlete, you just don't need that many carbohydrates. Understood. Understood. And do you do you uh, also uh, help with them? Uh, obviously, there's a science to blood sugar stabilizing blood sugar and concentration. But do you have a, a, a bucket of clients that wants to have a better understanding of food in regards to concentration? So I think a big part is, you know, like fruit is healthy. Fruit has nutrients. Fruit has natural sugar. And one apple does not mean one serving. So this is like a true serving of an apple. It's pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, And this apple came from one of those big bags. A lot of people don't buy the big bags of apples. They buy the larger ones that come just, you know, you just grab whatever ones look good. And a typical apple is around three servings. Wow. So someone may have one large apple and say, I just had one apple, when in fact they actually had three servings of an apple, and that ends up being a ton of sugar. So portions matter. One typical size banana is often two or three servings. So although, again, it's natural sugar, it's better than high fructose corn syrup, it is still a ton of sugar. Mm -hmm. um, now, the whole glycemic index, we just, I'm not sure it's all that helpful because it also depends on like what sort of soil the carrots are growing in and are they, you know, is the banana ripe or is it not ripe? That will mm -hmm. affect the glycemic index. So I don't get that kind of um, into the weeds, but when I, when someone has something with sugar, I try to tell them to pair it with something that has a little bit of fat and protein because that will again, keep them full longer. It's got the fiber, the fat, the protein, it's going to slow down the rate at which the sugar is dumped into the blood. And so pairing these two together can be very helpful. Um, now, little things like this, like honey, 10 grams of concentrated sugar in here. It's a lot of sugar. Right. Now, if you're an endurance athlete, like when I was training for a century ride on my road bike, you better believe I was taking in the honey because you need fast acting sugar to replenish uh, the glycogen stores in your muscles while you're doing an endurance event. But the most, most of the people going to the gym, 
are not there for two hours. They may there, be there for 45 minutes or an right. hour. They don't need honey. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you say that. Um, so what is, do you put a parameter on sugar, sugar consumed, or you just mm -hmm. are, are more uh, a advocate of the timing of the sugar? If I said, hey, I want you to consume less than 10 grams of sugar a day. Do you do something like that, or do, are you more of you can have sugar at these times post training? Um, I focus more on the added sugar. So if someone wants an apple, that's fine, but pick a small apple. If someone wants a banana, that's fine, but have half of banana. So you know, after workout, you want to have some protein, but you also need simple carbs. So if you like fruit, then after a workout would be a good time to have the fruit. Now, having a huge bowl of fruit at midnight right before bed is not the ideal scenario because mm -hmm. that's a ton of sugar and it can definitely interfere with sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so you definitely want to have your, your higher sugar items earlier in the day. Um, but, um, but it's really about limiting the added sugar. So like honey, agave, although they're technically natural, we still consider them added. So unless you're training for an endurance event, getting rid of the added sugar, the high fructose corn syrup, the baked goods, the croissant, just get rid of that mm -hmm. and, and focus on getting your natural sugar from fruit. So it's not sugar free. It's just choose natural sugar options that will help keep you full and give you the nutrients that you need. Understood. Understood. And I, and I, I was reading, I was studying up in that you specialize in like digestive and liver health. Is there, mm -hmm. are, are there a few things that you can speak of that would, uh, other than drinking like the movie Leaving Las Vegas, what's bad for your liver and how can we, I guess, have a healthy liver? Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing is alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we say it all the time is drink in moderation. Unfortunately, people's definition of moderation is actually still considered excessive. Mm -hmm. So for women, it's typically one drink a day. Um, in a, so like seven per week. But that doesn't mean you can not drink throughout the week and then have seven drinks one day. That would be considered binge drinking behavior. For men, it's one to two drinks per day. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, when they go out, they're not just having one glass of wine. They're having maybe a bottle or something, or they're having some tequila and scotch and then a couple beers. So really moderation of, is key. Now, it's interesting when you look at what is the most common reason for liver transplantation one of the most common reasons used to be hepatitis C, but we have cures for that now that come in pill form. Alcohol is a common reason for liver transplantation, but if someone stops drinking, then a lot of times, if it's not too um, uh, severe, then their liver will regenerate and it can absolutely heal. The most common reason for liver transplantation is fatty liver. And right. fatty liver is from metabolic syndrome, from high blood pressure, insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia, visceral adiposity, so excessive weight around the belly, that has become the most common reason for liver transplantation. And I don't have a pill for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. the challenge That's is right. we can tell patients to eat less and move more and lose weight, but that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. We have to give patients and clients the tools in order to be successful. And unfortunately, those tools are often not given to patients and no wonder they don't succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're, yeah, I mean, you're obviously right, but I, obviously what we see day in and day out is there's really no uh, drinking in moderation. Like that never happens. It just doesn't happen. Um, so going back, I had one question in regards to mm -hmm. uh, digestive health. Are you a, uh, uh, take a probiotic, are you a probiotic person? No, there's actually not much data to support the use of probiotics. Everyone's microbiome is different at baseline. If you get a dog, your microbiome is going to change. If you get a virus, your microbiome is going to change. So if I check a stool analysis today and you get a virus, two weeks from now, it may be completely different. Mm. So how do I know what probiotic to tell you to take? Do you need more lactobacillus? Do you need more of something else? How much do you need? Do you need 10,000 colony forming units or 100,000 colony forming units? Should you take it with food or without food? We have no freaking idea. <laughs> okay, so hold on. So, so does, that mean, does that mean the microbiome changes day to day or is it week to yeah, week? Absolutely, week absolutely. I mean, you, things are going to fluctuate. These are bacteria in our gut and fiber 
feeds the bacteria. So fiber, dietary fiber promotes a healthy, diverse microbiome. Mm -hmm. So it's all about eating well to feel well, not just today, but every day. And you have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. You can't just expect to eat a salad and then go to fast food the rest of the day and think that salad's going to save you and negate all the other stuff that you ate. Our gut is our largest immune organ. So imagine what you put in your mouth several times a day has a huge impact on your health or your sickness. Understood. Understood. Okay. That was awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. So are you prepared to talk about as, you know, we, we discussed possibly hitting on some, some myths and debunking the myths. Are you prepared to talk mm -hmm. about those? Let's go. And then, and then you're going to tell us actually what we need to do, maybe three, four, five of the top things that we could do to get started today. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So one of the myths is, you know, all these diet food products. So particularly things like artificial sweeteners, they're in everything. Even your mouthwash has sucralose in it. Mm -hmm. And the, the artificial sweetener saccharin was the first one developed around the 1950s. And it was developed during a sugar shortage. And um, we ended up starting to use it actually more and more frequently because it was a cheaper alternative to sugar. And we thought, okay, with the obesity epidemic, can we substitute that sweetness with something that doesn't have calories or is poorly absorbed by the human body? So that's when all of these additional um, artificial sweeteners came on the market. But if you actually look at the study, so these artificial sweeteners are 300 to 600 times sweeter than natural sugar. Wow. Hundreds of times sweeter. Wow. We don't even realize that. I used to put crystal light in my water and chug it down when I was in class. I used to drink Diet Mountain Dew and sugar-free Monster. And I wondered why, why was I always craving sugar? Mm -hmm. That's so, so powerful. And, and it's in everything. And you think it doesn't touch like the fitness world. I mean, it's, I think even more prevalent in the fitness world because every drink mm -hmm. that you could possibly imagine a pre or post, I mean, let's face it, it's loaded with it, right? Yep. So like my, the drink of choice that I would have when I was um, doing long endurance rides, I actually wasn't a huge fan of a lot of those powdered mixes that have a ton of ingredients. So my go-to was actually, I would just use like an electrolyte mix that literally just had like magnesium, potassium, sodium, and chloride. I would dump this powder into water. I would take natural honey because again, you need sugar when you're doing an endurance event. So I would mm -hmm. put the honey in there. And I would take just fresh lemon and lime and I would squeeze it. So I'd like infuse the water to flavor it. So I used natural fruit to flavor. I got all the minerals that I needed and a little bit of sugar to replenish my glycogen stores. So I made my own kind of um, endurance fluid that actually was super refreshing and I felt much better. A lot of these kind of endurance drinks and powders have things like guar gum, like a lot of these chewable um, items. They have guar gum, they have maltodextrin. Some people are very sensitive to those chemicals and it can cause issues like bloating and diarrhea. That's the last thing you need when you're doing a hundred mile bike ride. Okay. Um, so the artificial sweeteners, they've done a lot of studies on both animals and humans and it's fascinating. They will give someone diet soda or regular soda and the person has no clue which one they got. They'll send them to a buffet and they'll say, tell us how hungry you feel and eat whatever you want. And so they actually track the amount of calories that they consume and their hunger scores. And what they found is, is that the people who had the artificially sweetened beverage were more hungry. And what they found was they ended up actually consuming more calories at the buffet. So whatever calories they saved from having the diet soda versus the regular soda, they ended up actually unconsciously overcompensating because they were more hungry. And if you look at the blood sugar spikes after those two um, types of products, right after regular soda, you get a, a more rapid blood, blood sugar spike. But then if you actually look at the remainder of the day, which I think is probably more important, the remaining 23 hours of the day, the blood sugars were higher in those that had artificial sweeteners because they affect your satiety hormones differently and you don't get the normal insulin response. And it's crazy. And so it's those things that actually may in fact promote things like insulin resistance and diabetes. Now that's not me saying have a regular soda. 
I'm just saying both are probably equally as bad and have natural sugar infuse your water. If you want flavored water, put fruit in it. One of my favorites is just like cantaloupe and cucumber. And Mm -hmm. it's very refreshing. Use natural fruit and herbs to flavor your water and not these artificially sweetened drinks. Understood. Understood. And and I was listening to... uh... I'm sure I know you certainly don't have time for this, but Dr. Mm-hmm. Andrew Huberman's podcast, and he mentioned that I guess two the two most powerful indicators of um, longevity or you know death basically is those who sleep the least die first, and number two is resting blood glucose. Mm-hmm. And if and if you if you're challenged in the, in either or, your life will be shortened significantly. And it sounds like a yeah, no-brainer. Yeah, you know. I mean, people walk around with blood sugars in the two, three hundreds and they, that's their normal. They don't re- like it's normal to them. And when their blood sugar gets to 150, they, they get palpitations and sweaty because it's hypoglycemic for them. Mm-hmm. And they may feel normal with a blood sugar, walking around with a blood sugar of two, 300, but their organs feel that hyperglycemia every single second of the day. Mm-hmm. Same thing for high blood pressure. You know, people will walk around with a blood pressure of 140 over 90 They may not feel it, but their organs feel it. And at some point, there is only so much stress your heart and your kidneys and your brain can handle. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. And and we, it sounds like we should know those things, but we just don't, we're not, I don't know if it's mindful or pay enough attention, call it the same, whatever you want. But are you a fan of the blood sugar tracking trackers? One of my clients has a tracker that... He can put the app on the phone to the dot on his shoulder and you can track it pre, during, and post-workout. Do you like those? Yeah. I think sometimes too much data is too much data. Mm-hmm. So if you don't know how to interpret the data or you don't have someone helping you, it's not helpful. So if it's not going to change what you're doing, then, or if it's not going to change your doctor's management of your medication, I'm not sure it's all that helpful. Okay. If you have an issue where you're hyperglycemic and you're trying to figure out what sort of foods are causing that and you're going to act differently based on that information, it can absolutely be helpful. But a lot of this is not rocket science. If you eat cake, you're going to get a spike in your blood sugar. That's common sense. If you have a small apple with nuts, you'll have less of a spike. I mean, a lot of this is common sense. Unfortunately, common sense is not so common. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. You know, sugar kills more people than crap cocaine, heroin, alcohol, and tobacco. Yeah, that's right. And we know that drugs are bad, and we know that sugar's bad. But in Miami, we don't have billboards marketing cocaine and heroin, Mm -hmm. so we're not surrounded by it. We know sugar's bad. We know fried food is bad. But everywhere we go, we're bombarded with it, Mm -hmm. whether it's these juice bars or fast food or the bakeries or donut shops, everywhere we go, it's on social media, it's on billboards, it's on TV. And so it's constantly being pushed in our brain. We are telling people they need to do better, yet we're giving them all this overstimulation of all the stuff they shouldn't be doing and then expect them to say no. And it's just a sick world that we live in. It's uh, super challenging. When it, when I just walk through stores or I'm at a restaurant, I see the way people are eating. And listen, I'm not. I'm just as bad. I've been to restaurants and I'm gorging myself with food. I'm like, <laughs> I used to play football, and part of uh, the job of being a football player is maintaining weight for most of us. And the, and the way I used to eat, the fact that I'm alive is impressive. Seriously, I mean that some of the lunches and dinners just not healthy. I played with a, a college uh, buddy. He came to the university, uh, University of Richmond. He weighed 190 pounds. He was a quarterback. He left at 325 pounds, and he was drafted as an offensive lineman to the Kansas City Chiefs. That can't be healthy. I mean, it's, he was a – if, if I sh- showed you a picture, Dr. Michelle, of him in college and him now, you wouldn't believe it's the same person. You wouldn't believe it because he's a stick figure now, and in college – he looked like a one of the world's strongest men. He was a savage. It's unbelievable. So I guess I brought that up because eating and eating in that way is just going to wreak havoc on your body. So what else you got for us? Yeah, and just you know, just like everything else in our life changes. Um, I have plenty of people that come to me 
and you know they're 50 years old, they're perimenopausal, they're on a bunch of medication, they have a ton of work-related stress, and they're not sleeping. And they say, I don't understand why I can't lose weight. I'm eating the same as I did when I was 20, and the weight is not coming off. And unfortunately, the issue is they're not 20 anymore. And they're on medications that promote weight gain, their hormones have changed, they're not sleeping, they're stressed, their cortisol their cortisol levels are through the roof. And so their body has changed. And that's why, you know, dieting is, is there's a lot of nuances and it's challenging for people because we assume that we'll be able to eat the same thing and maintain the same weight despite our body changing. And that's just not reality, unfortunately. And so what works for us now is not the same plan that that would have worked for us 20 years ago. And what I tell people now at the age of 50 may not work 20 years from now. Our body, just as everything else in our life changes, our nutrition has to be just as dynamic. Mm. And viruses affect our microbiome. You know, a lot of people blame their thyroid on metabolism. That is only a small, small part of metabolism. You know, I, I always promote exercise. Now you know that exercise alone is not a great tool for weight loss. So if people go to the gym a couple of days per week, they continue eating the same, they're probably not going to lose weight. But what we know is irrespective of weight loss, the more that you move your body, you sensitize your body to insulin, you help get the fat out of your liver. It helps with stress and anxiety and depression, which are often leading to unhealthy eating behaviors. And one of the most important things is that it helps you maintain your muscle mass and your lean muscle mass is the key to your metabolism. Mm -hmm. So people often tell me, you know, why did my metabolism all of a sudden shut down at the age of 50? That doesn't happen, but what happened? Well, over the past 10 years, your career was a sedentary job sitting at the computer and you stopped moving. And during that 10 year period, you lost a lot of muscle. And that's one of the main reasons why your metabolism slowed down. It's not that all of a sudden at the age of 50, your body said, I'm gonna stop, you know, I'm gonna stop burning calories. No, it's, it's what you've done over the past 10 years that have contributed to that. Um, a lot of that is still reversible, you know, so I really encourage people to move their body. Now, there are plenty of people that are not like you and me who are not going to get up at 4 or 4.30 in the morning to go to the gym every morning, you know. That's just not realistic for a lot of people. But you have to figure out, and I have a lot of patients who travel all the time for work. So get, getting a gym membership may or may not be um, that feasible for them. But they can move their body. Mm -hmm. everyone can move their body. You get a water bottle and you're sitting on a call and you raise your arm above your head 10 times. And then you do the other arm or you do, you stand up from the chair and you sit down doing commercials. It's about figuring out how can you move your body? I don't care what you do or how you do it, but move that body. Our body was made to move. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Okay. Awesome. So I want to hear from you, Mark, like, when your clients, um, because they, you know, obviously invest in working out, they mm -hmm. invest time and money into that. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the struggles that you've seen where people are struggling with the nutrition and maybe they're not seeing the gains they want? Like, where are they going for, for information? Uh, I, I mean, um, I get bombarded with questions yeah. about uh, weight gain, weight loss, getting ripped, getting lean, putting on muscle. How much do I weigh? How much should I weigh? Do I look jacked enough? It's, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's insane. I mean, I think for me, and I tell, I share this with the team often. I, I personally made a shift from studying macros and in, in the in the science of internal to behavioral. In, in what not only we had a psychologist in today who was incredible, but it's not figuring out what people value and why. And as you said before, everyone comes to you or to me with a multitude of different reasons and experiences and history, uh, you know, personally, medically, call it whatever you will as to why they feel the way they feel today. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, with me, I tell people it's, Hey Mark, how come I'm not as strong as I'd like to be? 
I need to be honest. I, I, I had a young man maybe five years ago. He said, I, I feel like I, I have to do steroids. I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, I'm not very strong. Look at me. I'm a pencil and I'm 27 years old. I, obviously, I have low testosterone. I said, why, why do you think that? He said, because I, I'm not getting jacked. I said, I'll, I'll call this guy Mike. I said, Mike, mm -hmm. you've, I saw you in the gym for 30 minutes once this week. <laughs> I said, do you understand the amount of time and commitment it takes? Now, there's one argument. I can create a compelling argument to say you really don't need that much. And I can create a compelling argument to say you need a, a lot more. Now, Mike Lee needed a lot more. But if you lifted weights three times a week for 45 minutes, that's more than enough. If you push yeah. yourself, but if you want to get advanced levels of muscle, you'd have to be in there five days a week. It had to be very strategic, maybe do body parts and hit your body with enough sets, enough reps, enough pushing yourself, enough strain. That's absolutely necessary. Um, and you have to eat for that. So actually my more challenging patients is not getting people to lose weight. Mm -hmm. It's getting people with a very fast metabolism to actually gain weight. Because that is a big time commitment. There are people that have to consume three to 4,000 calories a day right. to put on weight because they're very active. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just about, you know, spending time in the gym, but it's what are you doing the rest of the time when you're out of the gym? Are you recovering? Are you sleeping? And are you eating for muscle growth? And right. it's not just about pounding the calories. You need to pound the right calories. Right. Right. Uh, so... I think the conversation always comes full circle and goes back to there's a few, you know, cliche statements that I absolutely mm -hmm. believe in and that look, a few of those are, look, you can't just go, I need to gain weight. So my, I need a cheat meal. I need a cheat meal. I told one client recently, I said, look, I don't think you understand what that means. First of all, I'm not a fan of the expression cheat meal. I'm a fan mm -hmm. of, look, if you want to have something that's super tasty, that may not be optimal mm -hmm. for you. You can have that. That's okay. Yeah. But to get completely off the reservation on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that means you, you're not, you don't live on the reservation anymore. You, you need yeah. to like focus on what you're supposed to be focused on to get the results you need. So I'd say you don't get strong in the gym. You get strong when you're not in the gym, in recovery, mm -hmm. getting plenty of sleep, getting plenty of water, getting plenty of, uh, you know, parasympathetic, uh, putting yourself in a parasympathetic situation, you know, to make sure that you can maximize recovery. And people don't understand how long of a road and a journey that is. Now, if you're a semi-athletic man or woman mm -hmm. and you have a decent figure and decent genetics, that road may not be very long for you. Mm -hmm. But I've had women I've trained, I say, look, so we can be aligned. I'd like you to bring me a picture of someone in a magazine, social media, whatever yeah. you want, that you would appreciate the way they look and you think it's attainable for you. And I think that's a great drill. That's a great drill because it shows me what their expectations are, but it also shows me if they're in or far removed from reality. Really. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great, like, I had one woman who was, you know, four foot nine bring me a picture of Giselle. And I was thinking... <laughs> She's 5'11 and completely different structure than you. So it, it, like, it's not going to work out. Now, it's not to be demoralizing or, or yeah. be pa passive aggressive. It's, it's really to let them know that you can get in incredible shape, but the journey is long. And the consistency necessary or required, you are not there. And a lot of people, to be honest, Dr. Michelle, don't like to hear that. And they go, I don't know what to tell you. So you're going to take steroids. I said, okay. That young man, that Mike, that wanted to take steroids, said you're 27 years old. His testosterone, I think, was 1350. I said, you don't have a testosterone issue. I said, if you have a testosterone <laughs> issue, they're, they're sitting at like 150. You know, I said, that, that's not your issue. I said, you know, you, you, you showing up is the issue. You being committed is the issue. And then... Another part of it is understanding what strain is. Like straining for me, straining for you, it's all relative. Mm -hmm. I had a, a client one time, to, I handed them a barbell. They understood the, ex the movement. They understood what they were doing. They understood the goal of repetitions. And 
the client looked at me and said, I can't believe you think I can lift this once. Now I knew the client and we started yeah. to have a conversation about something because they were, uh, they were a talker. Let's be honest. They were a talker. And <laughs> she, she was talking during the set. She pressed that bar 15 times. Now she thought she couldn't do it one time. So that's an unrealistic, uh, 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 less than optimal alignment, I guess, of mm -hmm. understanding what it takes. If she could do that bar 15 times, she told me she couldn't do it once. She doesn't understand what strain is. So it's my job to do a better job of explaining and coaching. And I put gauges on it on a scale of 1 to 10, how challenging was that? And I need to know what their 1 is and what their 10 is and what it means to them. That's really important. So th there's a whole yeah, lot. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, is empowering them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So empowering them to realize that they have more control and power than, than they realize a lot, you know, with everything in our life that seems so out of control, you have control over whether or not you wake up early, whether or not you get your butt to the gym, you have control over that. You have control over, you know, what you choose to eat after your workout. You may not have control of your work schedule or what patient shows up or if they show up late, but you have control over what you put in your mouth for the mm -hmm. most part. And whether you or not, you choose the apple or the donut, you have control over that. And a lot of people, I think, feel out of control, and it's kind of trying to get them to feel empowered to kind of take ownership of where they want their life to go. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of things I, 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 uh, that came up as you were explaining is we only have control of so many things, and mm -hmm. but those things can be very powerful, and they, they become even more powerful with consistency. And I think that that's the ultimate, like you said, do you choose the apple or do you choose the candy bar or call it whatever you will? Now, does it matter one time? The truth is it really doesn't matter one time. I don't believe it does one time. But over time, if you make that decision, the chances of you building a negative habit and making a negative choice, that's really who you are. And you've been making those choices for five years, 10 years, 20 years. And that's the reason yeah. why you are now so far removed from – better health or optimal health and i don't think people understand like you go into the gym dr michelle you could be in there four hours and what you get out of it in four hours the person who's never been in the gym is going to get more out of it in half an hour mm -hmm. and they it's it's completely different journey for you they have to understand like i have to go into this and create something special because it's going to add to me and it's not going to help me right now in 24 hours 48 mm -hmm. hours over the course of a week maybe even a but in a month, you'll feel a lot better and you'll start to see changes. And I think people uh, don't appreciate that the rapid change you can get from cognitive function and clarity alone mm -hmm. is super powerful, super powerful. So I don't know. I think people, you know, we're so used to instant gratification where if I do five sit-ups, I expect to have a six pack. Mm -hmm. That ain't going to happen. You know, but if you do five sit-ups and you do some cardio and more weight training and you eat well, then eventually you're going to see the abs. But just doing five sit-ups is not going to do anything, right. but it's all that combination. And when you mention, you know, having a cookie, it's not going to completely derail you. But a lot of times it's a cookie here and then a donut there and sugar in the coffee there. So it's one of each of these habits on a daily basis. And that constant stimulation of the neurotransmitters and the reward centers in your brain that then make you crave even more sugar. So oftentimes that one cookie is now going to make you crave that candy bar and mm -hmm. that's going to make you crave the honey in your yogurt. And so mm -hmm. that's the ripple effect is I look at how do ingredients, how do chemicals affect your brain? I don't care about calories. I don't, I don't care so much about macronutrients. How do those ingredients, the salt and the added sugar, how does that influence your brain that then influences what you choose and crave to eat the rest of the day. Right. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So now can you give us a few of those quick habits that, that we can start today? The audience can at least wrap their head around and maybe put into the practical today. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is one, focus on your liquid calories. You should really try to get rid of any sort of artificially sweetened beverages or sugar sweetened beverages. So use the natural fruit to infuse your water, things like that. Um, but you want to focus on the beverages. If you have alcohol, keep it as simple as possible. Don't have a Long Island iced tea or something with a ton of sugar. 
keep it simple. If you have wine, you have a light beer, you have you a have mixed, mixed drink, drink, maybe do like a sparkling water with some vodka or something. Keep that simple. Um, so I focus on the liquid calories, getting rid of juices. It's a ton of concentrated sugar. So no juices, no soda, get rid of artificially sweetened and, and high fructose um, related uh, beverages. So focus on the beverages first, because oftentimes it's the beverages that stimulate what you eat. And that includes things like cow's milk and sugar in your coffee and the creamer. A lot of people don't realize that cow's milk has 12 grams of sugar. It doesn't taste sweet, but there's sugar in there. And it may be that cow's milk you have in your coffee that makes you crave that pastry that you then have later in the morning. So the liquid calories are important. The second thing is a lot of people just overconsume carbohydrates. We need carbs to function. Absolutely. Brain function, we need carbs. But you can't have your rice and your beans and two tortillas and a pastry for dessert. It is too much. So try to keep it to one high carb item per meal and the rest should come from lean protein and load up that plate with vegetables. Um, and then the other thing is going to be eat when you're hungry. You know, we're so focused on, oh, I have to eat every two hours and I have to snack in order to maintain my metabolism. Hey, if you want to gain weight, then yeah, you need to eat frequently throughout the day. But the majority of us are trying to maintain or lose weight. Eat when you're hungry and it's okay to feel hungry. It is normal to feel hungry. You don't need to be afraid of, you know, having to have a snack right before bed because you're fearful when you wake up, you're going to have hunger pain. That's normal. That's your body sending you signals that it's ready to eat. It's normal to feel hungry. I think a lot of people become obsessed with saying, give me a medication that shuts down my appetite completely, but that's not normal. Your body's trying to tell you when to eat, you know, and then just be mindful when you're hungry, then that doesn't mean you go to a buffet, eat things that are truly going to nourish you eating well to feel well. Um, and, and those are kind of the key points. You know, I don't focus so much on weight. People come to me for weight loss. I focus more on how do we attain your why and how can I teach you basic nutrition for you to get there? And a consequence is you'll lose weight. I want to thank you so much. That was terrific. It's going to help a lot of people. Um, you're inspiring, uh, when you're training, it's certainly impressive and Every tidbit you dropped on us today was just wonderful. So thank you very much. Where can uh, the audience find you so they can follow you? Uh, Perlman MDs. So Perlman and then MDS is the website. And then um, that's the same for Instagram or my more personal Instagram is Michelle Perlman MD. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. You were amazing. Wish you well. Have a great meeting. We'll see you. Alrighty. Okay. Thank you, Dr. I'll Michelle. see you tomorrow morning. <laughs> All right. Thank you.